you had a lot of things going on over there, and if something went bang, 25% of the time it came from right here in Amatol. And if you've seen some of these pictures where they had bombardments going for days on end, you can imagine that 25% of those artillery shells were coming from right here. This is a map of the entire area that was bought by the Atlantic Loading Company. Atlantic Loading Company was founded in 1917 in the state of Maine. <clears throat> And on March 4th, they got 6,000 acres, which is this outside line here, of property down in the Pines of New Jersey, because it was far away from people, okay? They bought that to build a loading plant to make ammunition that ranged from hand grenades all the way up to eight inch coastal artillery shells and 150 and 200 pound bombs that they dropped from the airplanes. Within the boundary of this 6,000 acres, ultimately there was 50 miles of standard gauge railroad track. They started out with 31 miles, and that was all down here in the plant section, and one little railroad track that went out here to the city. They built the city because they expected 20,000 people here to work the plant. That would have made Amatol the second largest city in South Jersey in 1918. Each one of these little black dots on here represent various magazines, warehouses, electrical plants, um, headquarters building and everything else. And this little tiny dot down here by the letter A, that's the state police barracks. So you can imagine how big this is. This road out here going past, this is Elwood Weekstown Road. And you've got Columbia Road going up through here. Columbia Road went right through the middle of the TNT storage area. In order for you to use Columbia Road, you had to go through a checkpoint that was guarded by rifles and, and some machine guns. So you then got escorted to the other side, but you went through the same gate on the other side to get away from all the guns and the explosions. In addition to building the plant, they had a city. This is a map of the city of Amatol. Currently, in this section right here is where Mullica Township has their uh, Green Acres uh, football fields and, and uh, soccer fields and baseball fields. I don't know if you've ever been out there. Several throw ones are just up the road here. And uh, right in around here, there's a little tiny uh, cemetery that um, I believe it's called um, Laurel Hill or something like that. It's a little tiny cemetery from back in the 1800s. But this whole city was all planned out with major streets, highways. This was a proposed extension of the railroad that would come in one side and go out and around the other <coughs> instead of just coming in, picking up people and backing up. They had um, electrical plants. They had water supplies. They had, uh, let's see, there was uh, hospitals. There was schools planned. Only the ones that are black dots were the ones that they built, which is quite a few. Mm -hmm. And all the ones that are sort of shaded were never really built. Uh, they had dormitories for the uh, workers. They had dormitories for the uh, executives, because the executives didn't come down here with their families, didn't have time to. They just got here and got things going. They started clearing the land on the 4th of March, 1918. The first artillery shell that was prepared was in the 75 millimeter, the good old French 75s that they used in World War I. And the first one was made the 4th of July, 1918. So from the 4th of March to the 4th of July, they put together enough of the, of the uh, ammo plant 
to make just shells. And by the end of, uh, well, the end of uh, December in 1918, uh, they had finished their complete requirement. Of course, they expected to keep on going because the war was just going and going and going. But November 11th happened, and the war stopped. <laughs> so what do we do with all this? Close it. Get rid of it, just like the government does today. You know, <laughs> we don't need it anymore. But uh, I'm going to show a few pictures here. These are some pictures. I'll drop down so people don't have to look through me. These are some pictures of the buildings that were over at the city site. They had two general uh, administration buildings. They had the administration building over the city site, which was sort of like the mayor and council and everybody to run the city, which is this building here. And the administration for the plant was the state police headquarters building. Ah, got the wrong button. All right. And this is a photograph that my aunt had taken when she was working there. She was working in uh, one of the offices as a secretary. Uh, I believe at that time she was, uh, had just turned 18 years old. And these are some of the houses. And on the bottom of the original photograph, it says Charlie and somebody else. And we can't really read it because it's all faded out in the ink. This is one of the main streets, F Street, that was going down through the town. And you can see all the streets were like every other street around here, gravel yeah. or mud, whichever came first. In the downtown section now, if you go out by the, by the ball fields, uh, back behind the uh, ball fields, you'll come up to a gravel pit that the uh, city used. And in that gravel pit, you'll find a huge chunk of concrete, about half the size of this room, and probably about 15, 20 feet tall. That was a foundation for that water tower. And this building here was, uh, as it says there, the executive's dormitory. And then you had general dormitories for all the other people. And you had houses. You had duplex houses like these two houses. Uh, can everybody see that? Yeah. We can turn the lights out probably if you want. So some of, some of these... Uh, these photographs are actually taken from the book that your historical society has. So, okay, that, yeah, that makes it a little easier. Perfect. Okay. And uh, as you can see, it had two doors there, and, and uh, each one of the houses had five rooms, they said. Um, this is getting down towards the middle of town. This is your bank building, and also the post office along the side. And if you notice the types of windows that they had on the bottom floor, you always had the, the large glass windows, and then the, the oblong uh, rectangular uh, windows across the top. They seemed to be very prevalent throughout all the, all the city uh, buildings that weren't used for uh, housing. They also had a couple of YMCAs, and this is one of the interior swimming pools that was being built for the uh, YMCA. So you had a lot of recreation going on. And if you needed to eat, you went to the main mess hall. Now the main mess hall was this huge building out here. They could serve 6,000 people at the main mess hall for lunch and 6,000 for dinner. Can you imagine the size of that place? And then you've got the workers out here. Of course, you know what the workers are doing? Gardening. Taking care of all the tomato plants that are growing out here. <laughs> they grow their own vegetables. They had a piggery with over 300 pigs that they use for food and constantly, you know, importing things. And if you didn't like what was at the main mess hall, you had a cafeteria too. And I, I don't have the statistics on how many people could uh, be served in that, but you know it looks like a pretty substantial building too. Yeah. And here's another one of the main streets. 
You can see that it wasn't all flat like everybody seems to think it is down here. <laughs> there are a few hills here and there in South Jersey. Mm -hmm. What material is used to build those buildings? Pardon me? What was, what's the material in, the, in those buildings? Is it the majority of the buildings were wood framed, okay. but they used what they called a stucco wire mesh lath. Okay. And uh, the stucco was actually just sand and cement, sort of a little bit, uh, you know, a um, little bit sandier than the mortar that you get between your bricks. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Now this right here, this is the main thing in the center of town. This is Liberty Court. Uh, Liberty Court, like I said, you look at these windows and you get the little ones and the big ones down below. Mm -hmm. Liberty Court had a boardwalk on both sides here and these little slanted lines here are covers over top of the doorways going into various stores. There were haberdasheries, there was uh, women's clothing, there was all kinds of stores in there. And at the end of the court was this big building here. That was the theater. Mm -hmm. The theater, which I'll show you in a few minutes, was a huge, a huge place. You can't believe that they would have something like this built. And keep in mind, this was built between March and July of the same year. This is a photograph my aunt took of some of her friends at the stores. You can see the slanted roof I was talking about. And there are those big windows and the little ones across the top. So those you know, the public buildings. And this is a picture right here. The tall one in the middle is my aunt. Uh, I mentioned that uh, if you look at her legs compared to the woman next to her that's sitting on the, the, um, the railing there, my aunt had real skinny legs. <laughs> they were so skinny that her nickname in high school was Spindles. <laughs> okay? We shortened it to Aunt Spins, but she was also about 5 foot 10 and she played on the Egg Harbor City Girls basketball team in 1916. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have the name of a few of them there. The one that's, that's uh, to the left of her, the second one up. Her name was Chubbs. <laughs> <laughs> this is the theater. Now, if you look at that theater, uh, for one thing, it seated 950 people. Where's a theater around here that seats 950 people, even before the multiplexes? I mean, the only one that possibly could have done that was the Berlin one. If you took all the theater, you know, theater seats together, be maybe 900. But it had a, uh, an interesting thing, the way the construction was. This is the stage. It had a sunken orchestra pit, a real pit for the orchestra to be in. Movie screen for, you know, uh, Rudolph Valentino and whoever else was going then. And this is the organ console up here. Looking from the stage to the back, if you could see this on a real photograph, not a digital reproduction of a dot matrix print, these are all the pipes from the organ. You can barely make out the little throats here in the, in the pipes. And those are right behind this section. The whole idea was is that we open up the shutters in here and we can have outdoor concerts. I mean, they thought of all kinds of things in 1918. We think we have some wonderful stuff going, you know. Yes? But this was never inhabited. Oh, yeah, it was inhabited. They, you, they had actual movies and things there? Yeah. Yeah. For a couple months? This was all, all used for only a few months, but it was all used. If you go out there today where some of the houses were, you can tell where they are. You, you will find some chunks of concrete, but you'll also find hundreds and hundreds of daffodils and lilies of the valley spread all over that was planted around the houses. Yes? Who financed all this? The Atlantic Loading Company. Okay. Ultimately, the U.S. government. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now this is the, uh, the plant again. I just wanted to go over real quick the, uh, the sections. There's two railroad tracks down here. You had the West Jersey and Seashore Line, which is the Pennsylvania Railroad up here. And at the very bottom, you had the Atlantic City Railroad, which was the Reading Railroad. And they had junctions that went between the two railroads. And then there's this loop that went out that you could bring in rail cars to go either west or east from e either direction. Um, best I could say is this loop right here is uh, just about at the entrance to the old circus drive-in. Hmm. And then if you go east of the uh, headquarters building, there's one little place in the woods, maybe about uh, 100 yards past the, uh, the uh, state police barracks, you'll see all of a sudden it just drops like that. That's the cut for this railroad to go in here. The idea was if you had things coming in, you came in like this, you went up here, if you had uh, coal, you dropped it off over here at the generating plant. If you had um, various items for the uh, ammunition plant, you would bring it in and you would go along these uh, rails out here, which came around in a loop. You brought in the empty shells and artillery materials in here, and you brought in the uh, TNT in here, and then everything went through and came out here as, as loaded shells, and then you went up here and you went over here and you stored them in the completed round storage magazine. Remember I said uh, the ammonium nitrate, the fertilizer, the, okay? They stored that over here. Then they had miscellaneous storage. Miscellaneous storage means just about anything you could want. You, could, you had uh, detonators, you had boosters, you had uh, shell cases, you had artillery shells themselves. They were all stored here before they uh, went into uh, the plant itself. <coughs> Not only did they make the projectiles, but they also made the, the artillery rounds, the entire thing with the case and the artillery projectile. So you needed smokeless powder, and that was stored over here. And then to make amatol, you had to have TNT. So they put TNT way out here on Columbia Road. In between, they had a camp, okay, I think that says Camp Columbia, that was a, uh, art, a um, cavalry camp. Down here, right in here, this area, this is also a cavalry camp. This is about where uh, Mary's Road uh, Market used to be, I don't forget what they call it now, but the, the last of the uh, road markets over here uh, coming from Egg Harbor. And uh, they had the uh, uh, Army's mess hall was here, and uh, also the uh, Quartermaster Corps was over in here. This is about the area where you go into Wharton Park today. Uh, oh, they also had a telephone exchange. If you've ever been over at the uh, uh, State Police Barracks, uh, there is a parking lot that was to the west. They always had the state troop cars in there. That's where the telephone exchange was. The telephone exchange had 395 telephones for the city. That was probably more telephones than most of the other cities in the area, except maybe Atlantic City had. Question? Where about with the Moss Mill Road sit in relation to that now? Moss Mill Road? Let me see if I can. I don't think it's on there, but basically, Moss Mill Road went through. Right about here, okay? Today, this, this is the chemical lab. This is where they did all the chemical testing to make sure everything was correct with water. Uh, ammonium nitrate sucks up water, and when it sucks up water, it doesn't work as well. Uh, it had its benefits for um, artillery shells, because after five to 10 years, sitting in the ground, if it didn't go off, it would suck in the water and would start to decompose and then it wouldn't work anymore. So it had its benefit. TNT sits in the ground for 100 years and it still goes bang. But uh, Kent Lab is at the end of uh, 
uh, the section just before Sailor Boy Road, and that's what this this is here. This is Old Sailor Boy Road, and it comes to here. So this road, this right here, is probably Moss Mill Road, just not extended on beyond on the picture. Now, this is a whole series of photographs of some of the buildings that were out there. So you can see that it wasn't just a paper city. Uh, this one section is the smokeless powder magazines. Each one of those buildings, um, let's see, that's, each magazine had enough powder that would uh, load up 240,000 75 millimeter shells. Mm. And the smokeless powder magazines, I believe there was uh, 20 of them. So 20 times 240,000, you know, you're talking 40 million shells that they could load up out there. And this is the, uh, these uh, powder magazines. What's interesting is, is that if you can see this well enough, these little lines here with the dots, those are the water lines and there are fire hydrants all along the way. So if they had a, had a uh, fire, they could put them out. And then these lines in here, they had lighting, electric lights all along inside, so it was lit all of the night, so you can see if somebody was coming to blow the place up. Uh, this is just representative of what the maps were like. This book that, uh, that we got a lot of the information from has each map for each section, so you can see them. And uh, I was told that your historical society has that book. <coughs> so if you yes. drop by sometime, you could probably take a look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, the ammonium nitrate. Uh, if you go out today in the woods, don't get chased off by somebody. All you'll find is the bottom section of these buildings. This is all solid concrete, the base. This was all stucco, and this was all just corrugated uh, metal. The idea being, if it's going to blow, let it blow up. If people are inside of a, a room and the explosion goes off, if the flame doesn't get you, then it's what you call overpressure. All the explosive force crushes every one of your internal organs. Okay? <laughs> If we can get all that force to go up instead of be retained inside by the walls and ceiling and everything else, you got a pretty good chance of surviving. <laughs> so they made these walls of the thin metal lath <laughs> with cement on them and the roof so it would blow up. Yeah, yeah, so. Luckily, they didn't have any of those problems. Hmm. And uh, if you go in and see that what's there today, you'll see the floor which has a um, asphalt base to it. And you see all these big circles in the asphalt in the floor. That's because they just put these barrels right straight on the asphalt and they sunk into the asphalt in the summertime. Because if you remember, this thing started work in the summer and you know, it got kind of hot there. Another thing that you'll find in there on the floor if you go today, there might still be some little pieces of metal, maybe about four inches long and they're slightly curved. They were these uh, little pieces that fit in the grooves inside the barrels to help hold the barrels together. So those are a few of the things you can still find. Another thing there was down at the 75 millimeter plant several years ago, round metal discs with three little fingers that looked like they stuck against something. Well, I found out by researching that these were the shipping caps when they sent the artillery shells and they would be outside the, the building and they just knock them off and had a big pile, must have been about a foot thick of all these little end caps off of the uh, cardboard tubes for shipping. Um, and the TNT storage, uh, you can go out and probably see the bases of them. Again, you'll notice that all of the buildings, the, the um, slope of the outside walls 
basically what it is is you've got the shock wave coming from the, an explosion and you want it to focus up and away from your building so it doesn't blow the other building away. But because TNT was such a, a high explosive in the lower sections, you can see they started building sand barricades around each one of the buildings too. And that would also help deflect any of the explosions. Miscellaneous storage buildings, okay? These storage buildings are 46 feet by 260 feet long. Inside each one of these storage buildings, uh, it says uh, down at the bottom, if you can't read it, it says one storage building will hold 350,000 rounds of 75 millimeter shells. Or it will hold 2,250,000 boosters. Now a booster is what you have to screw on to the end of your, fu of your fuse. The fuse uses black powder, and then that goes bang, and it goes into a thing a full of a compound called tetral, which is a high explosive, and then that goes kaboom, and then that's what sets off the shell that's inside with the TNT. And I don't want to even say how loud that goes. <laughs> Uh, completed rounds, that was that section way up in the north end, okay? There were quite a few of those buildings, I can't remember how many there were, there was something like about uh, four rows of 11, I believe. And uh, the well, picture down at the bottom shows all the 75 millimeter shells stacked up in boxes along with the ones in the center, all the uh, boxes. And the center one has drop bombs. Okay, what they did is they also made bombs for their airplanes. And uh, each one of these buildings, again, is 46 feet wide and 260 feet long. And uh, on the bottom right side is a storage building with 50,155 millimeter shells. Those are the things we use over there in, in uh, Iraq right now, the big guns, okay? they will take out half a city block if it hits in the right spot. And you've got 50,000 of them in one building. <clears throat> then they had all sorts of other warehouses. And uh, the one center bottom, that warehouse there, nothing but nuts and bolts. <laughs> you can see they had a bunch of nuts and bolts they needed. They had, um, there's a warehouse full of uh, food, there's a commissary storage, there's uh, one down the lower left corner is uh, for electrical supplies, the one up above it is pipe, and uh, then you got general warehouse which had everything from wheelbarrows and shovels and everything else that you needed. This is a general plan of how they built the things with the uh, steel. And uh, there was uh, 6,000 tons of steel used to make the buildings. <coughs> some more of the general uh, plants, buildings here, as you can see some of the railroad. Uh, they also had uh, safety concerns. TNT is an organic compound which um, can give you severe headaches, raises your blood pressure, actually give you strokes. So you didn't want to take all this stuff home if you had, uh, you know, going home to your kids, or if you were going into a dormitory situation with a whole bunch of other guys with the TNT. I mean, you don't want to take more TNT back there and get everybody's headaches going. So the company came up with a great idea. Let's build showers for all of our workers that are working in the plant. When you come in, you would have a basket, and the basket would have a number, and you would take your clothes and put your street clothes in there, and you would get one of these little metal tags, and one of those metal tags would stay on the basket, and the other one you put in your pockets, and it would have a number on it, so you knew which number to pull down, and when you use the, the rope to send up the basket with your clothes in. The basket from up in the ceiling came down with the, with the coveralls you were going to wear at work. 
when you got finished working, you came in through when you got your showers, and you went over and you got your clothes by putting the old coveralls in there, hoisting the water up, hoist the, uh, the rope up, and your clothes would come back down nice and clean, not full of TNT. And then somewhere magically the next day, somebody had already laundered all these work clothes, and it's nice and clean again without the TNT. So they kept the, uh, you know, the headaches down quite a bit. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where we got those from, but uh, I know some of the kids that were living out there in the housing development had found the old city dump, and they were digging up those things left and right. And they also had some of the badges with actual photographs of some of the people still there. Mm -hmm. There was separate ones for men and women. You can see the women had separate uh, showers and dressing cubicles, while the men, well, the men were men. They all hopped into the communal shower. And uh, maintenance buildings. You had uh, mechanical buildings. You had plumbers. You had wood shops. Anything and everything. There was a. Uh, uh, Tool room where you could find just about any tool you needed to, to uh, work on some of the things there. Now, the other part that's in your book, this is an actual photograph of that page. It says plant operation. This is the stuff they made. <laughs> and the bomb on the right hand side, that's 36 inches tall. So you see it wasn't small. There's uh, mortar shells. There's what we call fixed rounds. Up in the, the fixed round has the cartridge case and has the artillery unit up here. Mm -hmm. Then you had just the, uh, the projectiles. This is probably a um, eight inch artillery shell. Uh, and all the little stuff in here are the detonators and the um, um, booster sh boosters that were uh, put in there in the bottom. And uh, this one right here is a drop bomb. It has the, uh, the fuse in here and has the booster. This is a screw on booster so you can take the tetral off if you're trying to defuse it. And. Do you have a question, Anthony? Pardon me? Yeah, I think there's a question back there. Well, yeah, the of operation, how many people were in this community? Um, <coughs> they, they designed it for 25,000. How many actually got there to work? Uh, I'm really not sure, but I estimate probably around 10,000 people were working in one phase or the other, either building or whatever. Um, the only two I really know about is my aunt, who was a secretary, and my uncle, who was a carpenter. But, uh, you know, those are the only ones I know for sure. Now, I've heard of some other people here. Um, your grandfather or your father? Your father what? worked with the, uh, take the coal to the furnace. Oh, so coal to the furnace, to yeah. the uh, generators? Yeah. Okay, so there was all kinds of jobs that you could get. Her father was making 75 cents an hour, which was huge money back in 1918. Mark, I mean, Mark, I have a silly question, but did the township of Mulligan and Hamilton know that if this place was ever hit, we would not have Mr. Bertino here with us tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, think about what would... There was no right to know law back then. <laughs> so, uh, nobody knew that this was even going on back here? Oh, I'm sure they knew, but I don't think that they fathomed how big it was and what could happen. They were, lu they were lucky for you the know. jobs. Yeah, you know, in 1926, there was an explosion over uh, in a depot up in North Jersey, and it wiped out a couple of square miles, you know. But, uh, and then there was also, uh, during World War I, there was sabotage of, um, in the Earl Depot up in North Jersey. Out, uh, they had all the storage of the rounds there, and they were shipping them out, and they were out on one of those big, long uh, railroad uh, piers that went out into the uh, Hudson. And somebody set off a detonator inside one of those and blew up a whole train load of ammo. And it blew out windows in Brooklyn. So you can imagine, you know, 
this would do just about the same thing. And I asked this question this afternoon. I, I, who are these people? Where did these people come up with the designs of these places back in the, in the early A lot of engineers. If you look in the front, this right here, this is a copy. Some guy went through, I think he was an engineer, and he copied just the first part of the book. If you look in the front part of the book, it lists all the people that uh, worked there. And it uh, gives a brief history of some of the executives and so on. I know that um, in researching this, I found a uh, section from the uh, Alumni Association of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And uh, there were a bunch of them that worked in here, of their alumni. So it was no you know, fly-by-night outfit. It doesn't sound it. It wasn't a, wasn't a mom-and-pop store, I'll tell you that much right now. So, and you're saying that when the war ended, all this just disappeared? Yeah. It just stopped? Well, they stopped making active ammunition, I think it was in February of 1919. Mm -hmm. They still had people here um, maintaining the facilities and some of the, uh, the uh, uh, equipment and so on until 1924 when there was only two people left taking care of all 6,000 acres. Mm -hmm. At that point, they went through, uh, I'll tell you, this is something too, you think that they, they kept an eye on things. There's a report in 1924 to the um, Army that said after they got ready to decommission the whole place, they had people come in and sweep up and clean, make sure everything was away. They found 4,000 pounds of TNT lying in the cracks of the floors and everything else. They found some artillery shells that fell off the conveyors. By the way, each one of those little uh, buildings that was in the production plant, there was a, a totally enclosed um, conveyor belt system that was heated. When you got a shell in, well, you'll see it in here. One of the first things they do is you get the empty shell cases. Okay, you receive the empty shell cases, and then you, you take them out of the, uh, take the shipping plug out. Now this is uh, to keep dirt and water out of there, okay? Then they put them in to the preheating conveyor belt, ran them through the preheater. It then came over here to where they cleaned them. You had a, in, every one of them had a lot of oil because they machined them. So you had to get the oil out because that would degrade the explosive, okay? From there, um, the pre, I'm, I'm sorry, I went backwards. They would clean them then to the preheating. The preheating would heat up the shell, so we get up warm to about the same temperature of the TNT. By the way, TNT is not just a little powder you pour in. TNT for them was 8,000 pounds in a big steam pot. Wow. You had to melt it. Wow. And then you went around, and each guy would go out here and he'd get a bucket. One of these buckets looks like a watering bucket full of molten TNT. You then had all the shells standing up on the, on the floor with a little rubber cone in it. You pour the TNT into it until it fills up the cone. Now, uh, the big thing is, is that you have to worry about the shrinkage as the, cartridge, as the shell is starting to cool off. If it shrinks too fast, it'll crack and the cracks are never right. They always go all over the place. And what happens is when you have a shell going down a barrel that's perfectly symmetrical, it spins and it hits where you want it to. If it's got a lump on one side, do you ever see a, a basketball that's it's got you know like a little bit of lead shot in it that the uh, uh, globe trotters use? And they roll it down the floor and they flip, they flip, they flip. Well, that's what your shell would do, and you won't know where that thing's going to go. So you have to be very careful with that. In the smaller shells, they did this with the uh, cone because it would let it suck in some of the molten uh, TNT. Also, air works on the molten TNT and it causes a different type of crystal. And the crystallization as it's setting up inside the shell would start to crack and throw it off too. So they have these cones, they fill them up. When they're ready to go, they knock the cones off and then they can remelt the TNT again and put it back into the original state. This whole floor in here 
is nothing but shells that are cooling off. You want it to cool slowly so they have these big heated rooms that the shells cooled off in. Now you have a shell that's filled up all the way up with your um, TNT. You've got to get your booster back inside. So you have all these guys in here with drill presses drilling TNT out so you can put your booster in. Then you had to go in here and inside the neck of each one of these is the screw threads to screw the booster in. You got to scrape out all the TNT out of the threads. Okay? Then you go in here and you, you do what these uh, women are doing here. It's called gauging. You have a gauge block and you put it inside and you make sure that the gauge block goes all the way down. If it doesn't, you have to send it back and get more drilled out. Because otherwise you wouldn't be able to screw in your, your uh, booster charge right. And uh, let me see, what is he doing here? Uh, I believe he is, if I can read that, oh, inserting, yeah, he's inserting the booster charge into the shell. So he's screwing that in. Then what you had to do is you had to weigh them. And there was a specific, you know, weight, plus or minus, that you could be in. And that you had to be sure it was because if you had a light shell, it would go farther. If you had a heavy shell, it wouldn't go as far. And you wouldn't be hitting where you're supposed to be aiming. Yes? They weighed each and every shell? Each and every shell. How long did that take? <laughs> well, it only took a few seconds because you just picked it up and put you're it on there. You're talking about thousands and millions. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, you notice another thing, too. This right in here, this is a conveyor belt. There's the conveyor belt. This is where the shells go, and this is where you get them. And when you're finished, you put them back on the conveyor belt. Now, these are only the 75s. If you got the 8-inch ones, they were huge. You didn't drill them like this. You actually put the, uh, the, belt, uh, put the uh, shell on a table that had rollers and would roll it around, and you just put a gouge in like a... Like a uh, um, Electrical, a lathe for doing wood turning. Just put a gouge in to gouge the stuff out. And you'd be standing there with all those TNT falling everywhere. Hmm. All right, you guys saw first. I have a question. With all of this explosive stuff, is there any record of the number of accidents that happened? I can't imagine they went on stage. There are a few accidents. A few? Yeah. <laughs> there are only a couple. They were, they were recorded in the Hamilton News. Oh, really? Only a couple. They're the ones they and I don't about. believe there was a fatality in any of them. Oh, yes. Did they work this plant 24/7? I haven't found that out yet. I don't know In if they. In order to do all of this. Yeah, I, I really don't know if it was an eight-hour or a ten-hour job, or if they had it going 24/7. Oh. Yes. Were similar to the military, were the employees given mess privileges and housing free? Uh, that I don't know either. Uh, you know, I, I can only go what little material I have from the book, you know, and I don't believe that uh, they said, ha you know, if you paid for it, you know, or if you were a company town and, you know. Mark, was this place, let's say on Saturday night we want to go out on a date. Now we're going to go down to this theater. Okay. Can can people from Hamilton just go to this theater? Oh, yeah. It's just a, this was not a community that was in itself. No, it was not a closed People community. It was not a closed community. Okay. The only thing that was really closed was what was within that barbed wire fence. The barbed wire fence. Yeah. yeah. So the community which was on Elwood um, Weekstown Road, you know, people could go there. Mm -hmm. Now, they didn't all go there. They also came to the hot spot. Hey, Garber City. Oh. <laughs> yeah. All those winemakers. Okay. And all those beer makers down there. They, we had, well, we've got a list of 97 people who were making wine in Egg Harbor City. And it ranged from, you know, a couple of barrels for home on the table throughout the year to Renault and Dewey and, and Bonnier and making tens of thousands of gallons. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you a real quick uh, short story. 
We had a, a member of our society that passed away a couple years ago, Ethel Resch. She died at the age of 105 and was sharp as any tack I've seen around. So she used to wake up in the morning and she, before she would go to breakfast, she said she'd randomly pick a block in the city, start in lot one and go through the people that owned that house, then go to lot two and all the people. When she got around to the end, then she'd go to, work, to breakfast. And I rarely found a mistake when she would tell me a name of someone that lived in the house. Rare. Anyway, she told the story of one time a bunch of the cavalry guys came to town and they were raising a real ruckus. Well, our um, marshal stuck them into the city jail, which we still have. Our city jail, yeah, I think it's like 12 feet by 12 feet. <laughs> Okay, you had to shut the front door in order to open up the cage. Okay, they put something like 20 guys into this little cage, 12 by 12 foot cage, and locked the door. And the door was really locked. It was one of these big old bolts that went across, and then they put a padlock on the outside, so nobody could come by and open it up. You know, you can imagine what, you know, OSHA and ACLU would say about that one today. All of a sudden, somewhere around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, a few of these guys started to sober up enough to realize, shit, we got reveille in a couple hours. What are we going to do? You know? They all got together and they lifted the roof off of the jailhouse. It was a cinder block jailhouse with a little roof on top. So it was easy enough to lift it up. They got the shortest guy to go through the open spot, he went out, scoured up some uh, timbers, knocked on the door and said, hey, I'm back, okay. They all lifted up the one edge of the roof and he started propping up the roof with all these timbers. All the guys got out, pulled all the timbers out, put them back where they got from, and they made reveling. Oh, the marshal comes in and the lock's still on the door, but nobody's home. <laughs> Um, going back to this, you can see there, this is where they're, uh, again, uh, loading all of the uh, uh, materials, to, uh, like they're uh, putting the primers into the, uh, the cartridge cases now, okay? These are the cases that you put the gunpowder in to make the bullet go out. Hmm. I know that wasn't the right technical way, but what the heck. Um, and then after they did that, they stamped a lot number on the base of the shells. So they knew when it was loaded, where it was loaded, and uh, basically, you know, if there's something wrong with this <coughs> lot, we don't want to use these anymore. Uh, then they started filling the cases here with powder. And then, of course, you had the people that had to check the powder charge. And they weighed every one of them, too. Then they took it on down to this guy who assembled the cartridge case and the shell and the um, projectile and squeezed them together to make the one uh, completed round. After that, they had to paint the rounds because they didn't want them to uh, become corroded on the way over the ocean. And they stenciled the completed round with a number on it for the lot number and so on. And then they uh, placed the round in those little uh, cardboard containers I told you about and put the little metal caps on the end again. And then they painted them shut with shellac to keep the moisture out. And then they sent them off to uh, the packaging uh, group here, going down another conveyor belt again, putting them in the cases, and then the cases went out for shipping. Now, that concludes the part that I wanted to tell you about the, the Amatol plant. Okay, well, there was a lot of different size shells. There was 75s, 40s uh, millimeters. There was uh, 4.7 inch. There was 6 inch. There was 8 inch. There was drop bombs and everything. All of them had their own individual plant. 
and they were set up that they could do two different size shells within the plant so if one section went down from a fire or explosion they could move over to the other plant and still keep their production going. This is an aerial photograph taken somewhere around 1927, 28 and you can see this is the completed round section this is the ammonium nitrate section miscellaneous storage way out here is the TNT and off the edge here is the city and each one of these lines here, these were the railroad lines coming in and that little building there is the state police headquarters building so you can see that it's quite a ways off and this right here this wide strip which I don't know what it was originally for that was the entrance way to the circus drive-in mm -hmm. so that gives you an idea of where that was this is Burdick's okay that's Burdick's bus stop and this was the train stop here where the train came in and dropped people off <coughs> and this is the racetrack okay now majority of that information I do not have stuck in my mind yet so I'm going to refer to a couple of notes that I took in 1926 Charles M. Schwab okay now everybody's heard of Charles Schwab yeah. the banker yeah. no relation <laughs> these Charles are this is Charles M. Charles M. was an industrialist to give you an idea how much of an industrialist he was president of Carnegie Steel he then wangled a deal with J.P. Morgan to buy Carnegie Steel but I'll let you buy it if you make me president of your new company U.S. Steel well, a couple years later he got into a tiff with some of the people at U.S. Steel and he took his money and he went out and bought another one Bethlehem Shipbuilding and Steel so you know the man was well healed knew what he was doing he was the guy that built this him and three other guys who I can't find anywhere don't know what they did I imagine they were in the steel business but he's the only one that shows up when you try and search him and uh, they uh, hired a guy named Jack Prince from Oakland California to build this uh, oval track the oval track was originally uh, being built by Prince because he knew how to build bicycle racing tracks he was a bicycle racer and a motorcycle racer so he built this entire track which is one and a half miles all the way around using um, southern hemlock and a type of spruce which I've never really been able to figure out uh, um, Engelman spruce anybody know what Engelman spruce is must be some sort of a special you know dense spruce or something but he got two by tens ten foot long now this information I got from uh, Clyde Bertzel some of you might remember him yeah. he was a tax collector up here in Mullica right. when he was a young kid I think he said he was eight or nine years old he was a nail boy now the nail boy went down to a hogshead which is a huge barrel full of nails 16 penny nails and he would get bags full of 16 penny nails and take them to the carpenters the carpenters would take those nails and drive them through the two by tens which are standing on edge so each time you put a board down you're only adding two inches nominally probably about one and three quarter inches right one and three quarter inches to the width of this track the width was 50 feet wide so how many two by tens did you have to make to put you know 50 feet wide not only that 10 feet long all the way around the circle I estimate that there was somewhere around the uh, order of 250,000 two by ten by eights or two by ten by tens to make that track uh, all told they estimated at 4.5 million board feet now a board foot is something that's 12 by 12 and 1 inch thick 
These started out one and good two inches. So you can imagine, four and a half million board feet went into making that. Then they had another guy came in, and along here is a grandstand. The grandstand used 1.5 million board feet. It was 75 feet in the air and seated 60,000 people. 60,000 coming to the race. Of course, they also had standing room for 250,000 more. The day that they opened up, it's recorded that there was, they expected 30,000 people to show up. They had 60,000 show up. The uh, police department was a little bit upset because they had parking. This was all graded out to be parking, and they had this out here for parking, and people were afraid they wouldn't find their cars. Now, I mean, you know, what's so hard about finding your car? <coughs> Model T's were all black. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, Model A's were about the same thing. So it was kind of hard to figure out what was your car. People started picking out where they were parking along the White Horse Pike, knowing that's where we can find our car. Well, the police got very upset. They said, no, no, not again. So they came up with plans. There was going to be the road, which here, by the way, this is uh, what you call Moss Mill Road going through here on this line. They widened Moss Mill Road to 66 feet. It had been like 35 or 40 feet wide. Mud, of course. They also got the Pennsylvania Railroad to come down. They built the train station down here which they named Speedway, New Jersey. They had special trains, 10, 15 trains a day when the races were going, coming down to drop people off. They don't say how many cars were there. But we know one thing for sure, there was plenty of, of rail track in the old city and the old munitions plant. The munitions plant originally had 50 miles of trains, uh, railroad, standard gauge. They had 10 locomotives and 30 passenger cars just to service their workers. But now you've got trains coming in here, and this right down here, that's the railroad track, and this is the White Horse Pike going across. Uh, they also had an interconnection with uh, the Reading, because by this time the Reading was just about ready to shut down because Pennsylvania had taken them over. It became the Pennsylvania Reading mm -hmm. Seashore Line. Um, uh, oh, so in other words, they, they built this, this grandstand, and that used one and a half million board feet. So that's a total of six million board feet of lumber. And uh, the uh, information I got, they said that that is enough to fill 253 railroad cars full of lumber. Now you can imagine a train coming in that stretched well beyond probably Winslow. I'm pulling up here to drop off some lumber. Uh, the parking, like I said, the parking was um, was solved by uh, telling them they're going to tow everybody away if they park on a White Horse Pike. They got the train station to bring people in, and then they got Burdick's. They built that as a uh, rest stop and uh, food and, and uh, water and also a gasoline uh, a pumping station for the Philadelphia Rapid Transit Company, which ran special buses down here, too. So uh, anyway, they continued on with the racing. My grandfather uh, and my father both used to tell me about when the races were racing out here, you could hear them all the way over in Lower Bank. So it was not a quiet thing. And then, um, uh, let me see. Uh, oh, 1928. 1928 is the last time they ran the races. But these were cars. Yeah, these were cars. They also ran motorcycles. Um, Never bicycles that the track was built for. Uh, no. Or that the man knew about. No, no, never did that one. Um, but the, uh, the track you can see right here was, you know, 50 feet wide. Now. That's the pitch end of the track. 
You can see where this is fairly flat here, but it goes up. And this was pitched up almost a 45 degree angle wow. to keep the cars from going off. Mm -hmm. Now, at one time, the race drivers preferred our track to Indianapolis. Because mm -hmm. Indianapolis is built out of bricks. And what happens with bricks when they get wet? Mm -hmm. They get slippery and you slide off the track. And there you go. So they liked our, our track here. And uh, this is another shot taken from the grandstand. You can see right over here, over the uh, scoreboard here. Right in here, you can see this is the normal pitch of the track here. And all of a sudden, it starts going up and going up and going up. And you, you haven't even gotten to the end where it's really up over here. Uh, there's about 12 world records set for 91 cubic inch ending, engines. That was a big engine in those days. And there is a bunch of other uh, world records set here. Uh, to give you an idea of some of the people, um, you had uh, people named uh, Jack Abel, Eddie Backer, uh, Ralph De Palma, Frank Elliott, Harry Hartz, and Dr. William Shattuck, which were really big names in racing throughout the early uh, teens and 20s. And then, of course, the cars. Uh, the cars, you had the Miller, you had Duesenbergs, Auburns, Ducatis, Stutz Bearcats, and Nortons, who was made by the motorcycle people. And uh, the first race, first prize was 30,000 bucks. Now, your, your father was making 75 cents an hour. <laughs> That's why people like to go racing. And this is a picture here of all the race cars getting ready to go. And that's the uh, grandstand in the background. So you can see how high up they were looking at the, at the pictures. Uh, as time went on, the uh, track just became a, a tumble down shambles of itself. When they started racing the motorcycles, uh, the motorcycle wheels had studs on them. And they started tearing up the wood. And the problem with the guys were is as they're tearing up the wood, you didn't want to be behind somebody because the splinters are flying out. And you're getting the splinters in your hands, arms, you know, legs and everything else. So after a while, they got rid of the uh, motorcycles and never did them again. But by that time, the damage had already been done. And I forget how many carpenters, uh, Clydes, that they employed going out there to repair and replace these two by tens. In order to do that, you had to cut through with 10 inch, you know, studs and then replace big sections, not just one that was bad. And they used to start a race that was like a 100 mile race and it would take you all day because of the stops that you'd have to go to uh, replace the, uh, the surface. And that basically was why they went back to uh, the brickyard. The brickyard then started to slope their, their uh, turns at the end, and you didn't have to replace bricks like you had to wood. And by 1928, they closed the place down. Two years of racing. Uh, after it was closed down, they sold the lumber to anybody that wanted it. So when you look around and find two by tens out there with holes in the side, you know, in your old houses, you can more or less guarantee that it was part of the old racetrack. Mm -hmm. And shortly after that, when nobody else wanted any more wood, I mean, you got to realize, you know, six million board feet is a lot of wood to sell. The Hamilton Fire Department came to the rescue. Burned it. Burned it down. They burned it down. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> had a party. And they had a party, and they practiced putting fires out. <laughs> So that, ladies and gentlemen, is about all I can really say about, you know, the uh, life of the shell loading and um, uh, racetrack. racetrack era here in, in the Pines, racing in the Pines. Yeah. Uh, the only other thing is, is that we still hear rumbles once in a while, especially on a nice quiet night in the summer, we can hear Atco go crazy when, <laughs> with the... Uh, you know, our, our Fonz used to come out here with his J47 jet engine and stuff. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Why did they stop racing? Why did they what? Stop the racing. Again, it was just because, um, not necessarily stop racing, period, but they stopped it here on the wood track. 
because the tracks were just too expensive to keep up, and you had Indianapolis, which by now was becoming the preeminent uh, uh, racetrack in the country, if not the world. Mm -hmm. Yes? The company that you said was from Maine? That's the shell owning company. Was they still, are they still in business? No. No. Yes? On the finished product, how is that taken to either the airport or the seaport? By truck or by rail? You mean the uh, artillery shells and stuff? Right. By rail. They all went by rail. Uh, you would go up here to Winslow and, and, and hook into the central New Jersey and go up to the, uh, uh, that pier I told you that blew up. Black Island. Yeah. Or you'd go over here in Philly. Yes? Who owns it now? You said that you cannot, okay. people can throw you out. Yeah, uh, let me see here a minute. Um, Six, I don't know what. they own. I believe it's number 20. Okay, well, this is the map here. There is a wildlife preserve, the Hammond Wildlife Preserve. It goes roughly through here. Okay? And then beyond this is all privately owned. There's a guy that has a house built here, and he closed off Sailor Boy Road, which I didn't know you could close off a road that was on the map for how many years and mm -hmm. still in use. But they closed off Sailor Boy Road, and he has a house in here. And in the, in the Christmas season, he lights up the old walls of the chemistry lab. Yeah. Wow. And the chem lab was interesting, too. There's only two walls. The other walls were, were blowout walls, so if an explosion happened there, it would blow out, and the guy would survive inside the chem lab. You know how Sailor Boy Road got its name? Uh, I don't really know. It, was, it went go way back into the Revolutionary War period. I taught in Mullica Township School, and we had one teacher. His name was Bill Horth Hawthorne. He was an art teacher. And he did some, I think he got his master's for now. I, don't, I wish I knew how to get a hold of him, but he had, did a lot of research on that and then did etchings of all Sailor Boy Road and the Amatol plant mm -hmm. and all that. Uh, that'd be but great. Great things to have for your society. I'm, I can maybe go on the internet trying to see that very well. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I know he was very enthused, and there was a history behind Sailor Boy Road. I believe it was a um, uh, what should we call it? a uh, stagecoach road for a while. Okay. I'm not sure. I mean, a lot of the places like like Berlin was long and common. It got mm -hmm. that name because. You know, when you got on the stagecoach and you were headed down to Tucker, and you was long a coming before you got there. <laughs> was uh, Amatol ever considered an arsenal? Because I know you manufacture and store. They were arsenal. just a manufacturing plant. They didn't store, when, uh, except for storage when it was made and then shipped. Okay. So it wasn't really an arsenal, what you would right. say. Okay. Not like Picatinny. Yeah, that's what uh, I was thinking. You know, Picatinny, they store a lot of stuff there. But it's not anywhere close to the when it's Earl up in Monmouth County. Right. That's they only store stuff. Okay, thank you. Mostly Navy, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? Very interesting. Thank you. Very, 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 very,